You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Buzz brought to you by the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and we are back with another Zoom recording so you can see our beautiful faces if you so choose uh, via YouTube. I just so- think it's funny that <laughs> I'm watching you via Zoom, but we're in the same room. Tom and yeah, I are actually gotta- <laughs> just sitting like we're at opposite ends of like an eight foot long table. Yeah, but we got a lot of really good feedback on... Um, on the YouTube video we put up and I've been clipping it up and releasing some as the week goes on. So uh, sometimes people don't want to listen to a two hour video of us and uh, our guests talking. Sometimes they want to listen to a 10 minute video Ah. or five minute video. So there's some really good stuff that gets in the middle of these podcasts. And if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing, we're trying to offer it that way on YouTube, just little clips of, of some of the highlights of what we're doing. You know, I, I don't, want to listen to two hours of myself <laughs> at all so you just make us do it in the office every day. <laughs> so. you know but the the last episode uh the rooted discussions with um the business of growing native plants uh, we want to thank you for such a wonderful reception um the first week listening stats of that far exceeded almost doubled our 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 all-time best like it's already shot up into the top 10 of of episodes for yeah. us i think it's number six mm-hmm. in less than a week i think we're five days in right now and yeah it's, there's it's, been those episodes that were kind of like a big step forward for us and they're not always the ones that we think are going to be that but like uh when cloudy west came on yeah. that was like a big jump all of a sudden we went from getting x amount of listens in a an hour and a day and a week to a whole nother level and um and it seems like we took that jump again. And this is one of those. And and I think the re- like for me, one of the real testing spots is. Uh, and again, it always surprises me when she does this. Does this, but Agatha listened to the podcast mm-hmm. uh, without me asking. She just kind of did it, and she was like, you know, I didn't think it would be a topic that I would enjoy because it's not my business. And she goes, I really enjoyed it. The two hours went by really quickly, and yeah. I learned a lot. And and that's what I wanted: someone with no knowledge of the industry to be able to walk away with something from this. Exactly, and exactly. So we're really excited uh, about how well this has taken off. And I want to uh, thank, I think it's Stephen Johnson that sent us a, a very mm-hmm. nice email. Uh, thank you for reaching out to us. We appreciate that kind of feedback and the reviews and and the Facebook group just keeps continuing to grow, mm-hmm. uh, which which is great to see. And hopefully that keeps going on as well. Do you want to, should we share what our next couple episodes are? Yeah. I mean, they're set so we Mm -hmm. can, uh, so the, uh, next episode will be, uh, be me. Uh, wow. Wow. What will be friend? (laughs) It it will be, be? (laughs) (laughs) uh, meet the New Jersey conservation foundation with Dr. Emil DeVito. Uh, Mm -hmm. we're excited about that. Yeah. We're very excited about that because we might have to put some earplugs in. Uh, Emil can be a little loud, uh, but uh, but he is, um, one of the more knowledgeable people in the state of New Jersey, exactly, just about yeah. the environment. And uh, he's got his hands in everything when it comes to conservation. In the he, state. he really does. He's, I can't think of too many people that's more knowing than, than he is. Uh, so we're excited to have uh, a meal on. Then we'll have another buzz with a mm-hmm. to yet to be determined topic. Mm-hmm. I don't think yep. we've, we've figured yep. that out yet, but, uh, and then we will have our next rooted discussion, which will be, what is the government's role in restoration? Uh, mm-hmm. Which, you know, this is something that that we deal with at Pinelands Nursery every day. Um, a lot of our our customers don't. Um, some of them do. Uh, I think a lot of our listeners maybe don't realize the government's role in restoration. Yeah. We have a really packed uh, group of people, and a lot of people yeah. with strong personalities. This, this might be the. Uh... <laughs> It could either be the hardest episode we ever have to do to moderate, or yeah. it could be the easiest because they might just take over. We may, we may have, <laughs> might see me on the Zoom taking a little nap in the corner. <laughs> it will probably be the least amount that of you words, ever hear yeah. me talk. <laughs> yeah, the words we're gonna say. <laughs> I could just sit there and kind of enjoy it. So yeah. we're we're really excited about that. So uh, mm. we hope everyone tunes in for those. And again, thank you for all the listens and the great feedback and. Uh, hopefully this can keep going. It's in the last four months, 
our listens have pretty much doubled. Yeah, I'd say, which oh, is yeah. which is pretty amazing. We're now uh, we were rated the number twelve nature podcast on Apple Podcasts, mm-hmm. and so, we're holding pretty steady in yeah. that range. And um, and when you look at the top of the charts, it's always there. It's some of the, well, I guess not the more Green Dreamers is yeah, Green Dreamers was one. That's always in there. There's always a new, like there's yeah. one in there that has one episode because that algorithm is new subscribers and things yeah, like that. So yeah. you always have someone that's a new podcast that will be there for one week or two mm-hmm. weeks and then drop out. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, there's a, a lot of, uh, of distance between us and then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, you know, being in that like close to the top 10, that's good company. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. And hopefully we can keep that there. So, and again, that's a credit to everyone at home listening and, and watching us so. oh totally yeah. totally all right but frame before we get into it i yes. have some breaking news here oh oh there was an it. intruder in the eagle's nest at duke farms and really? it was live on video this morning it was um it was actually another eagle <laughs> that came in <laughs> but uh but it was a pretty cool video i guess um the leading up to this event the uh the eagle that was sitting in the nest i don't know if it was the mom or the dad but the eagle was sitting in the nest and it looked like there was one egg in the nest um started out to call out because it must have seen this other eagle around trying to get its mate to come back Ooh. to hell and uh and then it started to really kind of shield the egg and then eventually this other eagle came in and it got a little feisty it was really? I, you know it was it, an interesting video I, I i wonder what the whole predatory interaction is between eagles like mm-hmm. well i wonder if if an eagle will destroy another eagle's uh uh eggs or, ne- or they were just know. trying yeah. to take over the nest. That's that's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what went on, and I I literally just saw it before we came on here. Oh but, man, that is breaking news, yeah. and I haven't watched the the eagle cam in a while, so I guess it's back up and running. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. Yep. So that's great news. So I'll have to definitely. And there's an egg in there, so I want to yeah. see that. Which I didn't know. I don't know much about eagles i know less about eagles than i knew about ducks so, <laughs> so can we get an eagle expert is there that, an eagle i'm sure there's someone we can. all right all right i would love that because that seems to be the one question we always tend to have so mm-hmm. are you are you ready to get into the, oh, yeah. the next segment Let's all right do here it. we go it's hot all right would you would you like to go first or would you like me to go first i can go first okay um, i don't even know what you have so I'm yeah curious yeah my, to... so my plant this week and i actually did my homework i'm not right. completely just stealing this <laughs> off of our last episode <laughs> but uh my plant this week was andrew pogan virginicus which oh, daryl said nice. was his favorite plant for the winter and uh and why it's my favorite plant this week is i've been i was driving to um where, where was I driving? I dropped someone off at our, our local Fish and Wildlife office, and I took the back way, and I passed this giant field that was full of Andropogon virginicus, and it was a, a slightly overcast, but mostly sunny day, and just the sun hitting those, and they were just glowing gold. It was really, really cool. They're just complaining, um, completely standing upright. It was, um, it was quite a sight, and I've been noticing some smaller fields of it where you get they're a little bit more sporadic but this is almost like it almost looked like it was planted there so it was, yeah. it was pretty interesting i've been whenever i see a field now i make sure i get my colorblind sunglasses mm-hmm. on uh yeah. so i can really take advantage of it you know it's it's funny because you don't think of you know when i got them it was december mm-hmm. you know and yeah you want to see it for all the blooms and spring and all that but i love the winter color because a lot of that winter color isn't in my normal palette and i don't get to see it so mm-hmm. this time of the year is really interesting for me yeah. actually when when i first got those i probably shouldn't have driven yeah. for like a week <laughs> yeah. because i i had them on and i was just like wide-eyed like i know i had a conference in delaware down in dover uh shortly after i got them and all i did was like at lunch i just walked outside and was wandering around staring like a zombie so yeah yeah but so. it's um and it's not i'm i'm talking about how great this field of it looked but it's something that can look cool in your garden and give a little bit of like four season interest um or i guess it's probably still three season for when it yeah. uh, no we'll say no, four I'd, seasons I'd say four seasons um as long as you leave it standing over the winter it's gonna give you four seasons of interest and it's just a different color than you usually get this time of year and it's uh, and because it stands upright in most cases, it's still gives you that that texture to your garden. Awesome. Awesome. I was just thinking as you were saying that, I was like, you know what, my background photo, I should probably take a picture of that in all four seasons, the same spot. Make yeah. Sure- 
yeah, yeah. with the <laughs> well there's not a lot <laughs> no not, there's <laughs> right not a lot now. to see right now yeah. Yeah, a lot of it's gotten moved yeah. at that point so um so my choice is black chokeberry which is photinia melanocarpa formerly aronia melanocarpa mm-hmm. um so one of the things and we and we mentioned this plant a, a few times uh, or chokeberry a few times um so black chokeberry there's a red chokeberry and a black chokeberry uh and because it's not wildlife's favorite tasting fruit it's it's more persistent so uh, i i was looking alongside of we have it alongside of our office um and it was starting to be towards the end of its its lifespan but yeah. um it provides uh, really good late season nourishment because um, it's not the first choice. So it's it's usually still there at this time of the year. Uh, and the pointy buds are very noticeable right now as well. They're yep. not really mm-hmm. swelling, but it's a very pointy bud and it stands mm-hmm. out. Um, black chokeberry is a facultative species where the red is a facultative wet, mm-hmm. the um, the black. So it, it it's a little more persistent in in drier areas as well. Um, and if you have trouble during the summer telling the two apart, the underside of the leaves are glabrous, which is hairless, mm-hmm. um, and the red berry is pubescent, which is hairy underside of the leaves. So mm-hmm. it's a good way to at least, if you if you can at least ID that it's chokeberry, but you can't figure out which one, that's a good way to, to figure yeah. it out. So there's one thing that for our listeners, now you can take that home and and show your your friends or whoever you live with that you know some uh some sat words yeah (laughs) glabrous Glabrous. i had to (laughs) well you know it's i'm trying to be educational you know glabrous and pubescent and i'll I'll mention mention you andropogon virginicus is also a facultative species um and when we say that we're referring to the wetland indicator status which uh i'm sure many of you know but those of you don't know it's really i think we might have even talked about it on here before uh, but it's an indicator scientists used for how often a bat plant is going to occur in a wetland. Yeah. Um, so something that would be facultative is a 50-50 chance that you'll find in a wetland or an upland condition, it, where it, if it's it, facultative upland or, or an upland plant, those yeah. percentages change. You know, and it's pretty interesting that Andropogon gerardii or big blue stem is um, facultative because it does mm-hmm. shoot very deep roots it, it kind of acts mm-hmm. like an upland well, upland grass so. gerardii might be virginicus is facultative okay that was my plan what's, Ger- what's gerardii is that oh i'm too? sorry i'm confusing the two. Oh, I it's okay i apologize i'm gonna look it up this is, all right this is right. live research going on right now go. i should remember i think it's an upland uh, so virginicus is broom sedge broom and sedge gerardii and is big, big blue, blue stem. stem yeah sorry and that is in the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plain. It is also facultative. Okay. So, All right. That's yeah. So either or, they yes. both shoot. Yeah. Uh, they both tend they, to be. Yeah. Depending on your region, they're either facultative or facultative up. And yeah. for Virginicus, I looked at the map, and it's native mostly to the southeastern U.S. Goes up into New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and that's kind of the line, and it follows that angle down across the country to Texas. Yeah. Um. But the other thing, friend, and this is another, this is kind of like how the the sausage is made behind the podcast. (laughs) This is like a live thought stream going on. I think we should open up a new segment called Fran's Complaint. (laughs) Ooh. Do we have that and much time? I have, we, I have we're typically a, cutting it short. <laughs> I have a topic for you too. Not that that's, not that I'm one to complain. <laughs> that's that's when uh when they change the botanical names on us. That would be a good France complaint. Oh. I don't know if you can do it on the spot, but you know what? Y- yeah, we I, need to I come can. up with the theme I can. music and all that. Well, here's the problem that I have found with changing the botanical name. Doing what we do for a living and and a lot of our customers, a lot of our conversations are done in botanical and not common mm-hmm. because certain plants could have numerous common names Mm -hmm. um and there's overlapping like um carex scoparia and andropogon virginicus are both broom sedge Mm -hmm. so it makes a little confusing if you're going by common or something like clepra almifolia which is sweet pepper bush or um summer sweet alder or that you know it's and depending on the region we still get common names thrown at us that that we don't know so yeah, yeah. we we kind of do or die by the botanical and then you change it so all mm-hmm. of your literature needs to be changed and i understand the sign you know they're doing sinus sci- oh, yeah. sinus science and reclassifying um but there was an issue when i worked at princeton nurseries um regent scholar tree got changed from sephora to stipnolobium because mm-hmm. it was how nitrogen was uh distributed in the roots and then 
everyone stopped buying the plant because they thought we stopped growing it, mm -hmm. um, not realizing it was a name change. And then after five years, it got changed back. So, um, you know, something and that's very common and very well known um, gets changed and it throws people off and they don't understand because yeah. it's not rolled yeah. out like a, a new model car. And it's, it's, gets, it also gets tricky because it's not then standardized across the industry with um, when Scarpus for a lot of the, the Scarpus species became Shanoplectus, there's still people who call it Scarpus. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get seed quotes all the time where they're looking for Scarpus atrovirens and now it's Shanoplectus atrovirens. And if they don't know their plans and they don't know the name was changed, they get confused when it comes back. And, oh, where's the Scarpus on this list? So it's not, not only that, like Eupatoriums, a lot of them have been reclassified to mm -hmm. your trichomes or, yeah. or colestinum. Like they've gotten mm -hmm. changed numerous times. What's it? Conoclinum. Yeah. And then we have to relearn how to pronounce all this stuff. <laughs> and, We're already and doing listen, it wrong. I'm sure we have this conversation all the time. I'm not even positive yeah. that my pronunciation is the co yeah. con correct pronunciation because mm -hmm. we all say things a little differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you heard it last week. Um, I don't know if we actually had said any of this stuff back to back, but uh, I've always said for milkweeds, I've always said Asclepius, which I'm growing more and more uh, um, leaning towards. I'm saying it wrong because I hear so many people call it Asclepius. Uh, we call it Schizocarium, Schizocarium. Scoparium for little blue stem and Steve said, and Steve, I don't even know how to pronounce that's what he said, Schizacrium. but yeah, so it's um, and I would tend to believe Steve is right over me, me too, yeah, you know. So, yeah. um, and then we were talking about how we say Chalone, and then I started saying Chaloni, and you said it was, I thought it was Chalone, but it's Coloni, Coloni, yeah, uh, after the, the Greek nymph, uh, yeah. that that was turned into a turtle after she refused to visit Zeus's. Yeah. Zeus's so, wedding and Hera's wedding. Yeah. So, you know, it's so that's my complaint. There's there's no standardization because not everyone updates their literature mm -hmm. uh, all the time. Or if you have posters and everything gets outdated, and I understand there's a science behind it and there's a reason that it's being done. It's just a pain. Yeah. Yeah, damn you, scientists! <laughs> We're trying to make a living here. <laughs> so that's my that's my complaint. Like yeah. they're they're going to change smooth cordgrass yeah. Spartina. Um, is being changed to Sporobolus, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a, a very difficult one. Which is a completely different family. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you know, and I'm I'm happy that the science is is finding out all these differences, but mm -hmm. it's it's a nightmare in the nursery trade. So, yeah, um, yeah that's my big complaint. That and was how. Yeah, that? that's I'm not surprised that I'm one to complain. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to come up with some some like intro music to that. But, yeah. <laughs> How about it? How about this? <laughs> All right, and that's, I'm, I'm that's a that segment down. that will never run dry. Is, no, is we have no. you have enough complaints. <laughs> so speaking of complaining, one of the reasons why I chose black chokeberry was we mentioned during rooted discussions that uh, two years ago um, black chokeberry really didn't produce a lot of seeds or fruit so we didn't have a lot of seed and we're lacking in inventory and then mm -hmm. a quote comes through for eight thousand uh yeah. black chokeberry yeah. and the more i thought about it was that's not just a lack of supply and demand that is a real gross misunderstanding of habitat because there's nowhere in nature where you're going to walk and see eight thousand yeah black chokeberries yeah. and i think that's they're creating a monoculture that's a really misdesign it's a lack of communication with with native nurseries to see mm -hmm. if that plant material is even available. I just think the whole thing is wrong from yeah. <laughs> from, <laughs> from start to finish, you right. know. And it's I I thought about that after the fact. I'm like, we didn't even approach that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Is that sometimes if you don't if you know we were saying a lot of these architects or engineers don't know plant materials, there can be that's why there's a need for environmental yeah. firms to be involved oh, yeah. and, and monitoring and cataloging. And there's to, been a big, um, big push from all sides of the industry, from the designers, from the architects, from the, the nursery side, from the specifiers, from the, um, the contractors actually doing the work that this communication chain has to be uh, better developed. And maybe that's a, a round table we do at some point. Yeah. Is uh, we're starting to get to a point with all the round tables and the, the, um, guess that we are finding that we have way more than, than we have time to do. Yeah. So 
yeah it's it's I'm, but that would be an interesting one to have to kind of analyze that that chain at least for us i don't know no you guys i at home want to listen to that i but. agree and you know maybe that's something we can approach for rooted discussion we mm-hmm. did we have it just about set up it's going to be this summer it's going to be more um woody the business grows, of growing yeah. plants but woodies and maybe mm-hmm. that's something because herbaceous is a little bit of a quicker turnaround woodies mm-hmm. is a much longer process maybe we can approach it with them what do you think yeah yeah that sounds good to me all right enough on enough on my complaining not that, I'm, <laughs> not that i'm one to complain are you ready for the next segment yes we are all right let's see you can get with this, or you can get with that. all right so uh i was really shocked at this but the, me too the, I, the winner i knew um, i i wasn't gonna wait, do well well it's, i i didn't i didn't feel that way but the winner is is me 10 to 4 you know we didn't have as many votes but i was really shocked that that as many people found my article as interesting. Yeah. i really thought i was being self-indulgent and just picking mm-hmm. something that that interested yeah. me i wasn't you know but wow i was kind of shocked yeah. so i'm Good up, job you're on a roll wow two in a row yeah so i'm up three to two right now but this week i, I have no idea what your article is so i know yeah. what, you know what yeah. mine I, is but um so i'm gonna choose to go first okay um and i'll let you let you uh go afterwards so um my article was put out by four uh channel four new york nbc news um and it's called nesting pairs of bald eagles found in every new jersey county for the first time in 40 years so speaking of eagles because we just mentioned that earlier you know i i found that really interesting and um They've been monitoring since the 70s and 80s, and going back into that time in New Jersey, there was only one nesting pair of uh, bald eagles, and a lot of that is attributed to uh, the the introduction of DDT, which mm-hmm. decreased the uh, eggshell and and uh, yeah, the, a lot the of thickness, so the thickness of the eggshell. thickness, right. yeah, and and the 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 babies couldn't um, or embryos couldn't survive mm-hmm. incubation because of how thin mm-hmm. the the eggshell was. So, um, with that being corrected. Uh, all 21 counties in New Jersey uh, have nesting pairs of eagles, Essex County being the last one. Uh, 220 nesting pairs wow. in New Jersey, which is impressive, uh, which bared 307 young eagles this year. So wow. Wow. that's phenomenal. Uh, and there was another 28 additional pairs that didn't nest. Mm-hmm. Um, so very, very interesting. Maybe Maybe one of those pairs is – ones that attacked uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the eagle cam yeah. uh but a record 36 new n- uh, nests found in 2020 with 27 in south jersey and seven in central jersey um they're saying over half the nests are in the delaware estuary bay like mm-hmm. delaware bay being in uh, salem cumberland and yep. cape may county yeah. which kind of makes sense because it's really underdeveloped mm-hmm. uh there and oh, yeah. it's probably the the right habitat form um and that's pretty much it. It's it's. I just thought that was a great comeback success story. I know in our Facebook group, uh, Richard McCoy posted uh, saying how eagles are are uh, they're seeing a decline, not a decline, um, but deaths due to lead, lead from yeah. from mm. uh, shot or hunting. Yeah, basically, basically, like where they eat the carcass and mm-hmm. yep. have a shot with lead. So yeah, and that's something with the, from the hunting side of things for a lot of uh, at least the waterfowl species. Uh, you're required to use um, steel shot so you yeah. don't get the lead poisoning. And there's more and more uh, hunters that are just doing it on their own where for upland birds or for for rabbits and squirrels and those kind of things where they're just choosing to use steel or tungsten or, yeah. or different kinds of metals that aren't going to be toxic because uh, you hate to see it, but every once in a while you don't find something that you, you shot. And um, sometimes the, the animal doesn't die right away even though you hit it, but it, it might die a few days or even a month later yeah. due to due to injuries. Or even sometimes it just gets into uh, cattails or something really thick and you can't, even though you search and search and search, you just never find it. But other things do. And yeah. um, and with lead shot, they can, it can be toxic yeah. to them. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's my article. I'm curious to see what you have. Yeah. But with, yeah, with all the, the eagles in the state it still couldn't help your philadelphia eagles in any way uh, i don't even want to <laughs> have that conversation yeah but that's it's pretty cool i remember just being a kid and, um when we saw our first eagle here i was probably a teenager 
mm-hmm. when we saw our first one flying over. Now there's uh, <laughs> on our video, friend, <laughs> friends putting up a little thing saying vote for friend. I, I was, I was hoping he didn't it. notice that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and uh, yeah, so I was a teenager when we had our first one fly over. I was like, wow, this is really cool. And now I see him on a weekly basis because we have some that are, uh, there's a nesting pair that's right less than a mile away. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and we have them on our one of our seed farms all the time. They're, they like hanging out in the trees over there and, and looking for stuff. So. And there was actually one of our former drivers uh, spotted and we went over. It was a few years ago. It was a golden eagle and a bald eagle posturing over a carcass yeah you yeah. know they were positioning and mm-hmm. i think the bald eagle ended up winning out but that's the first time i've ever seen a golden eagle in this mm-hmm. area the only yeah. time i'd ever seen a golden eagle before was in montana yeah and i hadn't i didn't get to see that yeah but that was that was pretty awesome yeah but and, it's, it's really is a comeback story it's it's pretty amazing i'm i would assume it's happening in a lot of other places in the country as well i would hope i would hope but it's the, the with how bad some of the areas of new jersey can be yeah the fact yeah. that that that's a pretty huge success yeah you look at essex county that's pretty close to new york city it's highly industrialized um but they finally got one they finally got one so it's it's a great hopefully that leads to to many more Mm -hmm. so all all right right. all right and and just remember uh when when you're voting between the two there can be only one all right all right what do you got tom all right so this was actually a a tough week for me looking for an article because i thought i had a home run um that i found and it was about native plants that were coming up in coyote scat and how they oh. use coyotes to figure out how to germinate plants better yeah and uh i saw it posted someplace i'm like oh this is a really good one yeah and then i saw it posted someplace else and someplace and it started to go crazy and then i was like you know what i'm still gonna use it but then i saw it was from 2014 and oh, that's okay. not really a current event okay so uh then i started to look a little bit more and there was actually an article posted uh, a couple days, actually yesterday, about um, scientists discovered a new bee species oh. on a uh, Bayer partner farm in Brazil. Really? And, but I know our audience, and I know they're not going to want to hear about <laughs> Bayer, so I didn't want to go with that that one All either. Right. But that's a, an interesting article. It's on um, on Seed Today. Yeah. Uh, about the and I'll read the title one more time. A scientist discovered a new bee species on Bayer partner farm in Brazil. All right. So. I hope it's not like I didn't read the whole article. But okay. I hope it's not a like a mutant bee. I hope it's uh, something yeah. naturally like occurring. A killer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a killer bee. Yeah. But what I ended up going with was from uh, the Boston Globe, and it was called "Preserving Not Just the Most Beautiful Landscapes, but the Most Resilient." Oh, and it was right. an idea piece written by Mark Anderson, who works with the Nature Conservancy on the East Coast. Okay. And uh, the whole concept was they actually came up with a scoring program. The Nature Conservancy came up with a scoring program All right. that while the beautiful areas, we need to preserve them too because yeah. they stand out to people. They, they inspire people. They make them care more about the environment. But they came up with a scoring pro- or program to figure out what places had the most value. All right. And they were looking at, oh, where'd my note go? They were looking at um, the resiliency okay. of the area, how how – uh how would be able to respond to climate change being yeah. a, an overall factor yeah. um the diversity of that area how many different species of plants were there how many different species of animals it could harbor okay and then uh the connectivity as well they want to look at how connected it was to other areas it wasn't just a little tiny hundred or hundred yard patch of woods in the middle of a development golf courses and all that it was something that was connected to other areas so it could have more of an impact. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's pretty cool that they came up with this whole system to to gauge it. And it's this targeted um, restoration process or conservation process really works. And they found that with uh, wetlands. When you target like wetlands, they found um, support or wetland habitats supported more bird comebacks than like any other. Wow. Uh, really? Any other area. And that's one of the areas that's really been targeted for restoration uh, across the country but especially here on the east coast okay and that's primarily our business is wetland restoration and i didn't realize it was as heavily targeted as it was interesting Um, interesting so those targets work and we even saw with uh with million trees nyc where they pledged to plant a million trees in new york city over a couple year span that they had a similar i'm assuming a similar scoring system where they found where the most need was for trees 
and um and areas where they'd most make the most impact and i okay. don't remember the video where it was but there's a video that kind of went over that scoring system and they it might have actually been in um a documentary called hometown habitat all right i think that was the name i think i've seen that we had the uh, oh was that the, kim the, no, no not kim ironman it's um oh man i'm blanking on her name I, but I'm we, look that one we up watched that at we, one of, at we our, one of our dinners. Yes. We had, yeah, we um, had that a screening of it. And, um, but they talked about in New York city and you could see the map and like the redder areas were, were the areas that needed more of, uh, more trees basically, yeah. because there was a lack of trees. And the other interesting part with New York city was they found where the lack of trees and the lack of open space also coincided with where there was more poverty really? so wow and that was one of their things is obviously planting more trees isn't going to help with the poverty problem yeah but it might help with the help people uh, mentally and socially by giving them a place to perception to be in nature so and uh hometown habitat was uh by Catherine zimmerman and doug Talmy was on there and yeah they had right. a bunch of different places that were featured it was actually really really interesting documentary that you made you know one thing you know when you mentioned the the lack of trees in flora in in poverty stricken areas one thing that that always stood out to me was uh at princeton nurseries one of my clients was a Heiser bush and i was visiting uh their headquarters in st louis to to consult on something and I thought it was interesting the the amount of outreach that Anheuser Bush did in the local community because leading into it, there were some areas that weren't as nice, but they were some of the most beautifully landscaped areas, and mm -hmm. that they really took care of the community. And what a difference perception yeah. that made! I could see like mentally, just like it was it was you know even though you could tell it was a little more uh, you know lo lower class income probably mm -hmm. it. It, it really beautified the area it made a huge difference you know yeah and it was it's nice um to... and it's something that uh we'll probably get into at some point on the podcast but how nature is really such a a good thing for people medically yeah. and th there's research that's been done where just having a window in your hospital room you heal x, x amount or percentage faster and having even a like a fake plastic plant in your hospital room, you heal faster, but having a real plant was even was even more fast. So, it's. Um, I would love to dive into that. There's yeah. a lot of areas oh, yeah, I would love to cover that we haven't gotten to yet, but that's one I would definitely. Native plants as as healing. Yes. Yeah. We just it's, need to uh, find out. And, and that was just plants in general. They found okay. that that having plants just helped people. They, They've even found in schools having a window or having plants on the classroom, kids learn better. There's uh there's all these things just we need to be connected in nature. It's it's just something a part of yeah. being human that you want to be connected to nature. And we've done our best to try and put a split and put a wedge in there and yeah. separate ourselves from nature. But uh at the end of the day, we want to be connected. So and totally, totally. That's like that's a good article, Tom. That's yeah, even though I riffed on it a lot. <laughs> but ah. no, the article was very interesting. Um and that that's only a week or two old. Okay. So all right, awesome. It's, uh, something for you guys to look up. And and if you're from the Northeast, if you're from Massachusetts or, or that area, you'll even recognize some of the, the locations they added on there in Vermont and Massachusetts. Awesome. And, and awesome. That. You know, speaking of articles, I wanted to point out one of our listeners in the Facebook group, Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group, posted an article about the history of an area near the Pine Barrens mm -hmm. from 1912, I believe it was. I, it's a very lengthy article and I haven't finished it yet, but man, I am enjoying, did you get to I read, read a good portion of it as well. And then I was like, Oh, this, I've been reading this for like 15 yeah, minutes. So how yeah. much longer is it? And I was only maybe a quarter of the way through. But did you read the, mm -hmm. the, um, where they explained why cranberry bo uh, bogs are flooded in the winter? I, I might so have lost over really it. interesting yeah. and something I didn't know considering yeah. we're in cranberry country mm -hmm. in New Jersey that um, they found that you know obviously when they started picking cranberries they were picking them from natural areas mm -hmm. and then they yeah. realized hey maybe we should you know collect plants grow plants mm -hmm. put them in one area to make collection easier mm -hmm. um, and they were saying that New Jersey plants because of the iron 
like produce yeah, like they, a better they, tasting. And they were a more prized berry Pri- and yeah. went for, for a higher dollar value. So what they found was as soon as they started grouping large areas of uh, cranberries together that pure, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it correct, pyrrolid moth larvae, which, right, which yeah. feed on huckleberry. Once once there were had, large groups yeah. of cranberries, it was easier feeding. So they they were saying they could destroy, I think they were saying the eggs of 300 moths mm-hmm. could destroy an acre a day, yeah. I think. So yeah. um, they started flooding the bogs over the winter until May to prevent the the larvae from from attacking them and it it, it deterred them where they went back to the huckleberry mm-hmm. and that's why they flood cranberry yeah. box to this yeah. day i had no idea that that's what that, yeah, that practice, was very interesting yeah that and the fact that they said that the entomologist when they did the first flooding gathered all the insects and took them to the philadelphia academy of science mm-hmm. to catalog and learn and they were saying that one third of the host of insects in the northeast uh northeastern usa are found in that area of lahawe yeah, yeah. Lahawe, which is that like kind of like the corner of three uh, counties in New Jersey, mm-hmm. Burlington, Mercer, and Monmouth, yep. which is where Princeton Nurseries yeah. was. So it was pretty interesting to me that I was very familiar with some of mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and just growing up in this area where, where I live like 15 minutes away from there, it yeah. was – there's a lot of places that I've driven through a whole bunch in like Prosper Town and Emily's Horn, Town. Horner's Town. It was kind of cool that kind of stuff to yeah. learn the history of Horner's Town. Mm-hmm. So in in that article, so it was it was it was really cool. So so you have two articles, uh, my Eagle article and Tom's uh, article about uh, how would you uh, targeted restoration. Targeted restoration. So uh, you can vote. We'll get it up uh, on the. Uh, in the Facebook, Facebook group. group, you like like normal. Yeah. You know the turnout. The last one, we didn't get as many we posted votes as a couple days late. I, I think that was probably. I, and I, I usually do it, and I was busy. And so I, I told Fran to do I it. I posted he, it, and then I forgot the votes. Yeah. So so <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> and just remember. And of course, the choice is yours. All right. So I I was spoiled because the last episode of the buzz we had a, a, a nice number of questions we did yeah that, and, that and we in. didn't have to hear from Saul so don't tell me he called yeah he did and and he was our only call <laughs> so um he's your friend friend you're gonna uh, have wait to, wait gonna just have because to. I know who he is friend word is a strong word to be thrown <laughs> yeah. around I we're we're I don't even know if I could say acquaintances business associates uh, business uh, <laughs> whatever you know him. <laughs> i i know <laughs> i know who he is he better not mess up my name again uh, no but but so we did we did have questions i want to ask you a bunch of questions and i want to have them answered immediately it's a simple question um no i didn't hear you what was your question all right so he he did mess up your name again he messed my name up again it's been uh, it's been i don't decade. care if you mess up your name <laughs> <laughs> it's been decades uh, listen he messed up your name, but at least he understands that your your gender. Okay. He's yeah, he's yeah. still very confused about my gender. So <laughs> so I, are you yeah. ready? I will say for for those of you who are listening, if you want to see our reaction, you have to head over to to the YouTube channel because this is videoed this time. This this is videoed. Yeah. So if <laughs> we'll have a live reaction over there. Typically, you know, typically we're uh hiding our 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 laughs. Yeah. But it's we're not going to be able to hide it. Nope. So, nope. all right, you ready? Hello, hello my friends, the pine nuts. It's your friend Saul, Saul Rosenberg, and I'm gardening here in what we call the Garden State of New Jersey. It's called the Garden State. Um fellas, when we last spoke Pam uh, and and Jim, I, I think I called you John. I'm awful. Gosh, awful. Sorry, Pam and Jim. Uh, you taught me about the deciduous hollies, and I love it. And I want you gentlemen to know, please, thank you. I am a complete advocate of the native landscaping, and I'm sitting here in my chair. I hurt my back a little bit, and I'm reading the garden catalogs, and I have a very specific question on what are called cultivations. Or, or cultivars of the native plant. Now, much of this topic is new to me. I had always thought that being cultivated meant knowing what the correct spoon was. However, I don't really have any spoons. And many of you have commented on how I keep a trim physique. It is very simple. I eat soup and I use a dessert fork so you don't uh, consume as much that way. So you might want to make a notation of that 
uh, you know, for your post-holiday diet. Uh, anyway, as I alluded to, I was looking to buy the echinacea, and I think it's a wonderful plant, and it is a native that you have recommended me for my sunny spots in, in my garden of loneliness. And I, I can't plant it all by myself, so I'm, I think I'll probably hire some strapping young field hands to help me out when it's time. But I'm looking at a catalog, and they offer what is called the Echinacea Magnum, the Magnum. And I believe that is named from the Magnum P.I. You remember the show. But, but Pam, I know you remember the Magnum P.I. He was the guy. He was wearing the shorts and driving around in a little red go-kart. And, and his friend had the helicopter. And then he had a mustache on. And, and then there was the unhappy man with the dogs. And I never understood because it was Hawaii. And why would you be unhappy? But anyway, I guess, you know, he needed a gig and they hired him. So my question about the magnum is, should I be planting that? Or perhaps, men, think about this, should I not be planting a cultivation of a beneficial native species? I remember, Pam, it was years ago, and this is why I know you are so smart, because you told me that you are the genius of species, which is a commentary I believe you made during a lecture that I attended uh, in which you spoke on a topic. So is it best to plant a pure genius of species or am I okay uh, planting the cultivar, the, uh, like the magnum? I, I thank you, uh, gentlemen, always. And as you know, my name is Saul. I, I wish you all a happy new year. Oh, goodness knows maybe a, a happy Valentine. <laughs> i don't know about your valentine's day friend but i think saul's is going to be pretty lonely yeah yeah in his what was his, his garden of loneliness, loneliness. Yes. <laughs> have you ever noticed that saul's always hurt like yeah not yeah. that he's one to complain either <laughs> but like every hurts his back he hurt himself on a hike yeah, yeah he's always yeah. hees always hurt so <laughs> I, I had to write some notes because again, there's there's some misinformation in that. I don't know about using a, a dessert fork for for soup. I, I I'm not. Gonna I would keep to, you trim. That would yeah. keep you pretty trim. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so just coming across with some of the things that that were incorrect. So you're you're no longer John. You're Jim. I, I was promoted to Jim. Which you're uh, promoted to Jim. at least he's not calling me Pam. That which, is that is was true. he saying Pam or Pam? Oh, you know what? I have no idea. Because <laughs> he does know, he does say he men. men he so he knows men, I'm so. a man, but I'm a, I'm a yeah. man named Pam. <laughs> so um, uh, so it, the, I think the term he was looking for when he was saying he thought cultivated meant using the right cutlery. I think he meant sophisticated or cultured, mm -hmm. not cultivated. But um, and it's, it's pretty obvious that Saul is a big Magnum PI fan. But oh, yeah. But he had the plant name incorrect. So it is Magnus, mm -hmm. not Magnum. And that was named after the developer, uh, Magnus Nilsson of Sweden. And the other thing is it's actually a variety and not a cultivar. And we're going to go into that mm -hmm. uh, after that. But uh, it was uh, selected in the U.S. Uh, from a U.S. native plant for having petals that stayed flat rather than drooping like a traditional uh, coneflower. So – uh, but provenance is unknown. I was able to, f I was not able to figure out what the mm -hmm. provenance of that was. So, um, in 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 the talk that I was giving that Saul referenced, um, I did not say I was the genius of species. I was referring to the botanical genus and species <laughs> of a straight species, <laughs> yeah. where echinacea being genus, purpurea being. Uh, I species. I do think that would be a nice nice title for you though you're, the, you're the sultan of sales the genius of species genius of species yeah. i like yeah. that so maybe we can add that yeah. <laughs> or change add that it to for, your business card yeah just change it the list is ever growing um but i thought it was interesting that this call came in and shortly after and the same day um mount kuba uh in delaware uh published their pollinator research on cultivars of echinacea straight mm -hmm. species so we're going to put the link to that because we're going to discuss this a little bit. And we're going to put the link to that on the native plants, healthy planet.com uh, uh, website mm -hmm. page, just under the the show, like we typically do with the links to uh, the articles and everything. So you can find them all in one place, yep. but uh, you know, this kind of brings up a whole different question and we kind of danced around it. We, mm -hmm. We've talked about it and I know we have personal opinions, but um, 
I thought we should discuss cultivars, and this is something we could probably do a, a rooted discussion on cultivars. Yeah, and, and I think species. we've even even talked about potentially doing that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that's pretty obvious now, my personal opinion is I'm not a fan of cultivars. Have I bought and planted cultivars or varieties? Yes. You know, in absence of being able to find straight species or local provenance. So I kind of feel that like Steve Castorani was saying in the root of discussion that that many times are a gateway drug. And if that's what turns people on to native plants, all the better because mm -hmm. everyone yeah. has to start somewhere if they have success or if there's something that draws them to them and it makes them aware of a bigger issue, then um, then that's great. Yeah, so. and it's I think we should start even by by defining the difference between a cultivar and a variety and even a, a yes. hybrid. Yes, because um, a hybrid is when you take two slightly different species and cross them to cross make them. something completely unique. Yes, where a cultivar is then a Asexually, a, asexually propagated. propagated. Um, so it, wow, this is so this is like one of those things where you you have to describe something but not use the word. No, <laughs> so, yeah. So it's tough. cultivars are propagated asexually, so mm -hmm. they're not done from seeds. They're it's done from tissue culture or budding or grafting mm -hmm. or um, they're they're genetic clones. So every single one is genetically similar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's. It should be genetically identical. Yeah, they're genetically identical, mm -hmm. where a variety is a group of plants within a species uh, that has one or more distinguishing characteristics, kind of like Magnus mm -hmm. having flat petals, flower petals. and But it will still usually produce true to seed. Not always, but most of the time you're, you're getting true to seed. That trait is carried through the seed, mm -hmm. which when you're doing a cultivar um, – let's say, and Tom did a great whiteboard ecology on this. If you're doing like Acer Rubrum Red Sunset and you take the seed and plant it, mm -hmm. it's it's only going to come up as you're you're going back to straight Acer Rubrum. Yeah, so yeah. you can't keep reproducing that where a variety you can. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it it's will because carry on some that, of those traits. And it may, the, like the Acer Rubrum example, it may come up looking very similar, but it's whatever, however crossed. Yeah. And the same thing with humans or rabbits or whatever you're you're crossing in your what's it the punnett squares yeah you're gonna have chances of of uh genetic differences you know like varieties are kind of like um in in humans would be uh you know having children with red carrying on like red hair genetics mm -hmm. or blue yeah. eye genetics something like that where it, it doesn't always true to name not every child you have is going to have that red hair but most of the time it carries through or most of the time uh it, it carries through in mm -hmm. eye color where cultivars you know my my issue with cultivars is if you were to have pinelands nursery all done of cultivars of fran you might be able to yeah. sell a lot of stuff but you wouldn't be growing anything yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, not a lot of work would be getting done it'd be a lot of talking and not a, a lot, lot of production a lot of talking and, and complaining if it got a little bit too cold or a little <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or your basement flooded again, or something. Yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah, so, and that's you not know, very resilient. No, that's, and that's that's what you lose when you go to cultivars. You lose the 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 eons of genetic diversity mm -hmm. um, and a and that adaptation of plants to a specific area for conditions and time yeah. and a, a you lose all the all the uh, years of evolution. Yeah for that plant which may not be necessary if you're yeah. in a place and you only have room for one or you only want one well you're not going to have a population anyway no but um you know but besides that some of these cultivars are chosen for specific reasons mm -hmm. and it might be a double flower or a yeah. larger flower or um a different flower color which 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 can not necessarily always or at to an extreme but it can mess up migrating mm -hmm. pollinators and and wildlife if it blooms at a different time and we've talked about that if you know a lot of these arrowwood viburnum uh, cultivars that that came out of chicagoland grows in the mm -hmm. midwest bloom a couple weeks differently than the arrowwood viburnum here in the um the northeast and the mid-atlantic mm -hmm. so it, it messes up the the whole pollinators that typically would be there 
um, maybe it's not there for their yeah. food sources yeah. there. So it, it, it's kind of throwing everything off or they may see a double flower and say, I don't recognize that. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not going to that plant. I don't know what that and is. It's, uh, it's something Doug Townley talks about a lot. And um, when he addresses cultivars, it's uh, or, or even native ours as they're sometimes yeah. coined. Um, oh, Richard McCoy hates that. A lot. I think yeah. uh, there's a bunch of people who hate it. Yeah. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I I don't like it either. I'm not a fan. But of um, I, I, he mentions that a lot of times if it's a similar color, basically if it looks the same as the straight species or very similar to the straight species, then the pollinator preference is uh is quite a bit less. But when it's um when it looks wildly different, like it has a double bloom or it's a completely different color or the leaves look different. That's when they found that pollinators didn't use those species as much. Yeah. Generalize, or that's a generalization. I'm sure not in every case it was like that. But. No, but a lot of times these, these cultivars are genetic anomalies. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, one example I, I know we've used a lot is I think Dura heat, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Betula Niagara yep. river birch <laughs> was known for taking very, very, uh, dry conditions and, mm-hmm. and hot conditions uh, where river birch is, I think, a facultative wet. So mm-hmm. it's yeah. typically on stream's edge can take that alternately flooded, alternately dry conditions that like floodplain, you know, but that plant was selected in, in the southern region of the United States for certain conditions. Mm-hmm. And if you try to naturalize it in normal conditions, it can't handle those conditions. So um, for from a naturalization standpoint, or if, if you have a complete set of clones and you have a disease that impacts them, it's going to wipe them all out. Yeah. You're not going to have where it may only take a patch of it. So in large scale restorations, I'm completely against cultivars. Oh, um, and, and I am as well. But, you know, for for a garden or, um, you know, like I, I have some things I just couldn't yeah. get straight species, you yeah, know, and it's, that's, it's and uh, going even further. With it, that's this is one of the things Steve Castorani from North Creek said was and, and Claudia West said as well is we're not in the home landscape um, and even with a lot of commercial plantings, you're not dealing with, it's a disturbed site. It's no yeah. longer uh, the, the connectivity is not even there. The, um, the original soil a lot of times isn't even there. Yeah. So yeah, if you bring in cultivars, you bring in something from a different provenance, doesn't really matter. But because you're dealing with the urban settings, it's yeah, not a natural not, setting at all. It's an urban ecology. It's completely exactly. different. So where, what is natural to that area? Nothing. Yeah. Where it gets a little trickier for me is when you start looking at homegrown national park yeah. and the idea of bringing back this connectivity. And now you have you and, and a patchwork of neighbors are all doing this. Well, that's where now you do have some connectivity there and you do need to have something that's going to support the whole yeah. food web and ecosystem. So it's, um, I think it does get and, a little bit more important as that grows. And, you know, and it's, you know, one thing I think that's important uh, and a lot of times I see native plant enthusiasts that try to get a lot of rare species or or hard mm-hmm. to find species, but they're not really suitable or they don't belong in that homeland. Like I, I yeah. appreciate that yeah. you're trying to reinvigor this species and, and have it more popular, but it's going in places that naturally it wouldn't mm-hmm. e- exist in any way. So it's, you know, th- those types of things I think need to be looked at as well. Um, yeah. There, there's so yeah. many factors and and I, I, I think we should just go back a step because we keep throwing the term provenance. Provenance yes. is yeah. – I guess the the region or the the location that the seed is born. Mm-hmm. So, um, the the provenance of a purple cone flower um, that we grow, we might know that we collected the seed in Burlington County, New Jersey. So that would be the provenance. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these times, the cultivars, the provenance aren't easy to find or or locate mm-hmm. it. And you just don't know if they're really suitable for the conditions. Now, I, I'm not going to completely pan them like even though mm-hmm. my opinion i i'm not a fan but i feel it's okay as long as you're educated and you understand what it is and and mm-hmm. what its purpose is and what you're doing just know what it is that that you're doing and and in a lot of cases i would rather see you plant a cultivar of a native plant than an exotic oh yeah for you sure. know it's it's on the right track at least it's on the same level uh mm-hmm. or getting you there so um it has its purpose. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the other thing, and 
and this is another like we could have talked about this on the growers thing. A lot of cultivars are patented, so mm -hmm. you have to have a license to grow this thing. Now, in my days of purchasing at Princeton Nurseries, I learned that the one way around the licensing is you may have a Duraheat river birch in your nursery. You can't sell it because you don't have the license. Mm -hmm. Well, you just call it Betula nigra. Yeah. Because that's yeah. the way around the licensing. And and that's I, I I've been I've seen this more than once a lot of times actually. It's like, well, it's dura heat, but I can't sell it to you as dura heat. So how many of these plants are going out maybe for restoration purposes because mm -hmm. people think that it's straight species and yeah. it's not yeah. and it and it, it fails. And we we talked about everyone wanting a success story. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not going to help. So yeah. Yeah. For me, when it comes to like the the hard line, I guess I have with cultivars. And I, like again, I'm while I choose to plant a lot of straight species stuff. And the reason I do is because even if it's one percent better that's still 1% better and I have access to it yeah. where I think like we we're saying cultivars open the door to a lot of people. It's, it's something that's a little bit more widely or a lot more widely available when it comes to native yeah. plants. It's already hard enough to find native plants. Um, just do your best to find something that's as true to the species as you can, that looks similar to the species. Yeah. Um, and, and the science is developing. That was yeah. another thing Steve yeah. mentioned is yeah. the, the science is being done right now. And that's Mount Cuba's doing it. You have uh, Andy White, who was a graduate student uh, yeah. in, um, in the University of Vermont five or six years ago that yeah. was doing some. You have uh, Penn State's doing some. Um, Doug Calamy has students that are doing some of this stuff. So the science is developing now. It's it's not something that's been done. Yeah. Um, and it's – while I feel like, to me, it's pointing in the, the straight species, local provenance direction, it's, yeah. it's not there yet. And you look at what Mount – Mount Cuba's done and um their research is really yeah they have some really great stuff yeah the the grain of salt I take with it is it was done in a small area in Delaware yeah and that might not be the same as Kansas or even here in New it, Jersey or if you're in Maine it's it, exactly there's differences that happen there yeah, it's um, a very controlled yeah. study from that from that aspect and, yeah. it, and it's going to vary yeah. depending on on where you're at in the, mm -hmm. in the region yeah. so you know I'd I, I, like I said, it's there's a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use it, just know, educate yourself, and and know a little bit of yeah. more about it. And, and set set your own. Here's the big takeaway I want to get from this: is set your own guidelines. Do yeah. the best you feel like you can. Yeah. But don't hold everyone else to the same standard. Yes. Hold, hold them yeah. to a standard where they aren't planting invasives, and maybe they're they're dabbling in some natives. Yeah. But if they choose, if you don't want to plant cultivars, and and your neighbor does. Don't get mad at him for planting cultivars. No. Oh, you're not doing it 100. percent We need to be nice to each other, and at least he's on board. He's on the train, going the right direction. Um, maybe he's not where you want to be, but no. maybe where you want to be isn't completely perfect either. Exactly. You know, it's everyone has different views, and and just because we view uh, native plant ecology doesn't mean that everyone does. And it's mm. I always try to remind myself, you can't control what every what en what anyone else feels. You can only control what yeah. you feel. So. Yeah. Um, you know, what I try to do is always use local provenance first, if mm -hmm. available, if yep. not, you know, I'll, I'll look for maybe a different plant that will suit the need. And if I can't find that, maybe I'll go to a variety. And if I can't find that, maybe I'll go to a cultivar. Mm -hmm. I kind of have like a, a chain that I try to exhaust and I can't hold everyone to that standard. That's oh, just yeah. what I do. Yeah. You know, it's, you have to come up with your own standards and we, we keep saying that there's room for all of this in the conversation. So I, I will take that over any exotic any day. Um, oh yeah. So it's, we're, we're all progressing. Even if someone's having the thought, that's a huge step. Yeah. You know, if they're thinking about it before what they plan. Yeah. I really do think we need to do a, a, a rooted discussions on this because we both kind of come from a similar well, yeah. we definitely come from similar background. We're sitting yeah. in the same room and yeah, <laughs> in the exactly, same company. Exactly. But um, I think we came to a lot of these conclusions. Well, we definitely came to conclusions separately and from separate chains of yeah. thought. Yeah. But uh, I know when I've talked to Daryl about it before, he has completely different thoughts on it yeah. as, than I do. But we're in the – and that's uh, Daryl Kubeski from Sunset Farms. Yes. Yeah. Um, from the last episode. But – at the end of the day, we're both doing something that's better than planning an invasive and exactly. planning, or planning a non-native or planning something that's just uh, ecologically barren. Exactly. So 
we can't let perfect get in the way of good. No, exactly, exactly. So I'm um, not drawing a hard line there. It's just more than anything. Yeah. It's especially it's when we don't know what perfect is. Yes. Yeah. There's still the science. You know, we talked about uh, Sam Drogi and the native uh, or the um, the uh, bee inventory. Yep. yep. Um, just that they're just really starting to know what they don't know. Same thing with with native plants. This a lot of this research is new, and we're just it wasn't until the the introduction of all these exotics that we really started to realize mm -hmm. what was happening. So, yeah. um, it's it, it's one of those things that as time progresses, we'll get more and more information. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is what we think we we know based on the science that we see every day, but science changes yeah you know and it's again you know, we could we could find science that supports both ends of the the argument yeah. so so hopefully people aren't upset with us because we didn't come out with a hard stance either no way. i and i'm not going to yeah it's, oh it's yeah i, I don't think i ever would either like no. we have our preferences but that doesn't mean we're we're exactly right so yeah yeah i mean yeah. we we choose not to sell cultivars mm -hmm. or varieties we we the only i think we sell one variety Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, NRCS certified for for Cape American beach grass, mm -hmm. and it's you know for a lot of these projects that's all that they will take. So that's that's understandable, but um, you know that's our stance, and and that's okay. That's our mm -hmm. stance, and and not everyone has that stance. So. Yeah. Yep. All right. You want to do a uh, a pod let's, deck? Yeah, let's do it. We're a little shorter there, than last time. So, so if, <laughs> if anyone know, if you're watching the video, if anyone saw me looking down, we happened to get a call into the question and answer oh. line while we were doing the podcast, which we're going to have to save that for was the next Saul's month. number. Or? It was not Saul's number. I don't even recognize the area code. So yeah. I, I mean, like, I feel bad for Saul. He's, he's in his garden of loneliness. He's a nice guy. He's always seems like a nice guy. I never met him, but he's your friend at the end of the day. He's, <laughs> wait, he's, wait, he's your why friend. you keep throwing this friend word around? I don't know. I don't know where yeah. this is coming from. You know, he's not, you know what? I, I will say this about Saul. He has sparked some very good conversations oh, on this yeah. podcast because yep. even though he there's a lot he doesn't know, he's asking and I appreciate yeah. that. Yep. He's asking the right he's questions. asking the right questions and that that's helping everyone uh through this, even helping us. So I I appreciate Saul calling in. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to do pod decks? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let me see. Since we have the camera, I can point this up here. So this is uh, the cards that Tom and I have been using. Uh, random cards that gives us a, a an episode um, an episode recommendation. Let me see here. I'm gonna pick one out randomly as I'm spilling them yeah. all over here. Let me see. This makes for great great the podcasting. Great podcasting, here, yeah. yeah. Oh. This is one we'll have to save for another time. So it's interview your significant other. Oh, yeah, other. which is something we've actually talked about doing as we well. We have talked about that. You know, Agatha was on board. Did you ask Melissa yet? Oh, yeah, she said she's she on board? Did. Okay, all right. I'm a little scared about it, but. Uh, this is one we can't do. Actually, we could do, but it's it's planned. Live one-on-one -on -one coaching session. So we could have someone call in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a we'll have to postpone that one. We'll too. We can't do that. that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's see. You know, Friend, what? you need to call Saul. Wait, you need to about, you need to talk him off the ledge. Let's see what this question is. <laughs> yeah. Let's call the person back. No, no, no we right. can't do it. All live. right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's see. Uh, no, this is why I quit, and it's oh, why yeah. I quit blank, and it could be why you quit anything. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do that one or you want me to pick something? I right, pick one more. Pick All one right. more and then we'll compare them. All right. Uh, okay. I got one. Newbie mistakes in your industry. So newbie mistakes. Are we saying the, the nursery grower industry or the native plant industry? You want to say ecological industry? Hmm. I guess it would be, well, I don't know. You uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, I think I'm thinking here. Um, you know, and I don't know if I want to approach it from the, the customer standpoint or the grower standpoint, but mm -hmm. if from the customer standpoint um, and any nursery, whether it's a native plant nursery 
or not. When planning any restoration or project, it's important to know when – even if you don't know who you're going to buy from, is the plant that you're requesting actually available? Mm -hmm. um, it's always good to check even if, if you haven't specified it yet. Just give uh, your garden center, uh, your landscaper, um, nursery call and just say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Is this plant readily available? Mm -hmm. um, you know what size is i was hoping for this size a lot of times a lot of huge jobs go out like i was just saying with the black chokeberry and and no one checked to see if those plants were readily available those 8000 black chokeberry are probably more chokeberry than are produced by native plant growers mm -hmm. in the northeast and mid atlantic combined so um it's always good just to check to make sure what you're looking for or if mm -hmm. it's not available how much time is needed before they're available or when's the best time to request those and if you can reserve them in advance um you know, the COVID has really taught everyone it's always best to plan ahead and reserve plants if possible uh, so that you have them when you need them. Most mm -hmm. nurseries will allow that without a deposit. I can't speak for everyone, but that's just, you know, when, when planning anything, make sure what you're planning is is somewhat available in the industry. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. One of mine actually kind of kicks it back to something we were talking about early in the episode, which is um, when, when you're... We, it happens all the time where people just don't even try and say the botanical name. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'd rather, when I'm on the phone with someone, I'd rather they try and say it yeah. and butcher it than not say it at all. I, I agree. Um, and I'll, I'll help them. Yeah. You know, if they try, um, if they're comfortable with trying, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll guide them through it. And, oh, yeah. and so they know in the future. Yeah. And like we were saying earlier, we might not even be saying it right. It's just how we've learned to say it. So, yeah, it's, you know, and again, I don't know what's right or wrong. It's yeah. for some of these, and we've talked about this mm -hmm. personally before. I've heard some plant names that drives me crazy when people say it a certain way, but they could be right. Yeah, I don't oh, yeah. know. And then the, the second one, which is kind of not just a newbie mistake, but it's something I think it's a mistake a lot of people make, and that's assuming that they, um, what's the right way to say this? Is it assuming they they know everything about a topic? Yes, and um one of the things we've definitely learned through all this is how little, even though we're in the industry, we're yeah. dealing with restoration on a daily basis. We've learned how little we actually know. Yeah. And um, it really comes down to like the fallacy of knowledge and how, uh, and this is for everything. People think they know everything. Like if you talk about photosynthesis, yeah. well, okay. I know how photosynthesis works. It's, yeah. I, I actually can't yeah. even remember the formula, but, but I know oh, it's sunlight goes in the leaves and then, yeah. but then there's a chemical reaction. There's, but even then, do you actually know how it works? And, and I, I have the basics, yeah. but I don't deal with it every day. It's not science that I, yeah I use, you know, if you were to ask me to use seventh grade math right now, mm -hmm. eighth grade, yeah. ge you know, geometry, I'm, I'm not going to do it because I don't use it every day. I, but, I passed it, but I don't. Yeah. But at the end it. of the day, I know how photosynthesis works because I know it's the sun going into the leaves and yeah. it turns chlorophyll. Yeah. Yeah. There, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we know the whole process, <laughs> but, um, but <laughs> we think we know so much. And uh, especially when it comes to social media, we just like to tout off everything we know and act yeah. like we're experts, but at the end of the day, we have a lot to learn nope. and a lot. And yeah, there's teaching moments where you can teach people yeah. things, but it's, you also have to recognize that you need to be the student as well. Know what you don't know. Uh, know where to, to find mm -hmm. the answers if you don't know the answers. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, and, and you're right. There's a lot of people like some of these arguments I've seen, some of these native plant groups, it's just like, why, why is this even an argument? And yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, I, I'm, I'm, very, the first one to tell you, I don't know, and mm -hmm. and and I that I could be wrong, that I may be misspeaking. Um, but just be cognizant of that. If you're if you don't know, that's a real learning moment for you. Look it up, find the answer, and then and learn something mm -hmm. and take it with you, and make sure you, you you try to remember that for the next time. So, um, yeah, and that's you know, uh, I'll, I'll even say whenever I'm I'm very hesitant. I've mentioned before, I'm very hesitant to post in a lot of those groups, but even before I'm going to post something, I almost always Google it first to see if what I'm saying is actually right. Even though I know it and I'm, I'm 99% sure or even hundred percent sure this is how it works. I always make sure I'm right before I actually start saying stuff yeah. because there's, a, I see a lot of stuff in there where people are very wrong and very adamant about how right they are. No. And so, you know, and that's, that's another good point. 
listen, mm -hmm. listen and be willing to learn, um, be willing to admit you're, you're incorrect if you're wrong and, and listen to what someone else is saying. They may be coming with a, just a different approach than what you're accustomed to. And, and maybe there's, there's something worthwhile out of that or some kind of common ground. Yeah. You know, we could have easily, even though we don't, deal with cultivars we could have easily took the stance cultivars are horrible you know and yeah, and, yep. and that's it and drawn the line and we're not doing that you know where it's, I, it's i don't know everything about cultivars. it's really across just um socially across all aspects today that's just how things have become yeah and um actually one of the articles i looked at was um was uh more politically based it was actually about news media and saying how we need to just ditch the model of news media we have because it all it is is just fueling division. Yeah. And um, and no matter what side you're on, you're gonna not like the other side. And yeah, you're all, you're. If I was looking for a news channel to watch, I'm gonna watch the one that agrees with my preconceived notions. <laughs> I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not yeah. gonna listen to the other side. And it's become more and more um, uh, visible this year than ever being. Someone like myself, who I feel like I'm fairly in the middle politically, yeah, yeah. especially. Um, but you, you, there's, there is a fact of what's happening, yeah. but it is just completely displayed wildly differently from either side. And you could go, you could choose your one source and yeah. read that one source that agrees with what, how you perceive it. Or you could read five sources and then take away, okay, well, what was the common ground? That's probably what's actually happening. And I may have my feelings about it, but that's not fact. Yeah. You know, and, and you but know, I didn't go that way because I didn't want to get too political. But, and I don't want to do but that I now like, either. I like that we shed lights to all sides yeah. of the arguments yeah. and um, in a way that we're not saying here's all sides, one's right, one's wrong. It's here's mm -hmm. all sides, they coexist. And yeah. Um, we need with, to coexist. Yeah, exactly. It's, and with the, the the next rooted discussion, I think our panel we have um, someone that currently works in government, mm -hmm. uh, someone that formerly worked in government that's now on the private sector. Mm -hmm. You have someone from a nonprofit uh, who works organization with who works on. with governments, and then another person who's only ever worked in the private sector, but's worked in the private sector on a lot of government projects. Mm -hmm. So you. You have all sides of the view covered. I hope it's a very good. Con I have a feeling it's going to be a great conversation. Oh, yeah. And it's it's for people who I know will listen to each other. And they all and they, they respect yeah, each other. They respect each other. So, so we'll they go better well. not prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then, we don't want Jerry Springer yeah, we, with chairs like flying. When when I guess if we don't do final thoughts on the buzz, but if I had a final thought for today, that would kind of be it. But the yeah. the last point would be when you find someone who's saying something that you don't agree with don't just say you're wrong or i don't agree with you yeah. find out the reasoning for how they came to that conclusion yeah. how they how they form those opinions and yeah the, after you do that yeah you can say okay i don't agree with you i wouldn't say oh, there's times where people are wrong but um you want to you want to listen to how they came to that conclusion because they might be looking at it from a different lens that you can't look through because of uh, race or gender or demographic or or all kinds of things yeah. kind of how similar we were talking about the cult bars there's people who look at it through a different lens and they're bringing different backgrounds and yeah. different yeah. different views to and different knowledge to that discussion that we don't have and um it's important when we do have that round table that we listen yeah. to them and not just say well, yeah cult bars are bad well Let's i am <laughs> going to quote my favorite tv show of 2020 for this which is ted lasso have you watched it yet on apple tv Yes, I have. Yeah. You have watched. Did yeah. you did you like it? Oh, I loved it. All right. I've I watched it, it four times now, yeah. all the way through. <laughs> so, yeah. but uh, in one of the episodes, he's talking about, um, you know, being made fun of or people assuming who he was, and he was like, you know, you need to be curious because if people were curious and asked questions, they would have found out a lot more about me instead of assuming mm -hmm. or yeah. judging. Yeah. So, be curious. If someone feels a certain way, why is a better answer than no? Mm -hmm. um, be curious. Find out why they feel that way. You might surprise yourself and, and learn something yourself. Um, and and maybe you'll get a different set of ears when you're when you're providing your side. Yeah. So and and when this airs, we're going to be what two days after the inauguration of, yeah. of President yeah. Biden. Um, 
by everything that we can see on our end, we should be going into a more ecologically friendly regime. Yes. Uh, which is, is really good. And uh, I'm sure there's listeners we have who didn't vote for, for Biden. I'm yeah. sure there's plenty that did vote yeah. for Biden, but uh, we all should be rooting for him to be the best president we ever had. The same yes. way when President Trump was elected, we should all have been rooting for him Behind to be the president and, we yes. ever had, not yes. rooting for failure. Because yeah. when you're rooting for failure, you're rooting for failure for the entire country, and that's fail when it fails you. Yeah. So, so it should be interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of environmental things I think that are oh, yeah. executive yeah. orders that are going to be signed today. So, yep. um, exactly, you know, every regime brings changes, uh, good and bad. So mm -hmm. it's um, it should be interesting to see what what this brings without being political just what this brings for the environment exactly um, as we yeah. move forward so we yeah. always hope for the best and and we've seen both democrat and republican just do some great things and and i think that's a topic that's actually going to be discussed in in uh the role of government and in, in restoration so, oh yeah yeah so it, it should be a really i'm really looking forward to this Me one too. i can't Me wait too. i can't we got a couple episodes to get through before <laughs> we, it but, we do we do but, uh, so what do you think? That's yeah. Let me see where we're at time wise. Hour and fifteen minutes. Perfect. We're actually Perfect. a little little lighter than normal. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that is it. We thank you guys again for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this buzz ep, uh, buzz edition of Native Plants Healthy Planet. Um, thank you guys for listening. Again, we we do this for for work with Pinelands Nursery, but it's a uh, it's become really a passion project of ours it's a so labor of love really enjoy it i i love i i love that i get to do this yeah and, that and i shouldn't say do we're this. doing it for work we're doing it in spite of work. <laughs> 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 well we came up with this idea it wasn't we wasn't the most th popular th thing this wasn't we came up this wasn't assigned to us this was us saying we want to do this and yeah. pitching it yeah. and you know the testament is its success and and this is episode 37 yeah um and and that we have a full backing you know mm -hmm. but necessarily early on it wasn't necessarily embraced with the same amount of enthusiasm yep. yeah. so i'm i'm grateful that it's it's taken off the way it has and we continue to get to do this yeah exactly so, so um we definitely want to give a big thank you shout out to rj comer for uh the music that he supplies to the buzz our new buzz theme music that we're also using for rooted discussions um what's it mid uh, nightly suicide. Nightly suicide. Nightly yeah. suicide. Make sure you stream or buy. RJ. Which is a great song. It, That's an awesome. Isn't song. that an awesome? Yeah. That was. I love that song. Yeah. I listen to that one often actually. So, make sure you stream or buy RJ's music on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume your music. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery. No S on that one. Facebook at Pineland's Nursery NJ. Instagram at Pinelands Nursery and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Actually, we're up to 70 subscribers on YouTube. I want to hit that 100 mark so we can yeah. give ourselves a custom yeah. domain. Yep. Right now, if you search Pinelands Nursery, we'll come up, but we want that custom domain. Mm -hmm. 30 more followers. Come on, people. Um, if you have a question and answer, uh, you can call or a question or comment. You can call our question and comment line, just like this uh, listener just did during this podcast. Um, you can call at 215-346-6189. I will say it again. Maybe I should get a little sign that I can hold up now that we're yeah. I can be <laughs> yeah. like uh, at 215-346-6189. Ask a question, leave a comment. If we pick your question or comment, we will play it and answer it on a future episode of The Buzz. And uh, don't forget the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. We're up to over 250, mm -hmm. and it yep. just keeps growing and growing. So, and great conversations. I love uh, all the different aspects that that people have been bringing to this. So, uh, keep it going. Yeah. Remember, you can also submit original music if you're a musician or you are friends with a musician who who doesn't mind you taking their original music. Um, because we're looking for a theme song for our rude discussions episodes yeah. that we have out. We want to give it a, a good identity. I really mm -hmm. feel that that uh Stephen Mars uh music kind of fits our meet the guest mm -hmm. episodes yeah, and yeah. and RJ's music definitely fits the buzz. I I don't know what I'm envisioning yeah. for rooted discussion. You know when when we first started I was uh Fran Fran said we couldn't do this. We couldn't just take someone's music and do it. But I and I was even thought about writing to the band if I could figure out who to write to. Yeah. But um I was always thinking of uh Uncle Tuplo's song oh. Sandusky which is an instrumental song. You'd have to get Jeff Tweedy yeah. to... Uh, yeah. You have to have some six degrees of uh, separation I actually, from him. While at a Robin <laughs> Hitchcock concert, <laughs> standing in line waiting to get into the venue, I the, the gentleman behind me drove down from Connecticut to New Jersey to see this concert, and he was Jeff Tweedy's 
or Wilco's, uh, he recorded, did a live recording of every one of Wilco's. So he worked with Jeff Tweedy. Mm -hmm. So not that I, Hey, maybe I, Jeff Tweedy's a listener and he wants yeah. to, he wants to donate that song. Do we for... have any celebrity listeners? Like I would think like Mark Ruffalo with how, yeah, uh, yeah. Which I've thought about reaching out to him to be a guest. And he's a New Jersey just, resident. Yeah. So he would be a great yeah. guest. Maybe we does I, a lot of environmental work in his spare time from being the Hulk. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that takes a lot of time being the Hulk, but in his spare time, he does find a way to help the environment. So, oh, yeah. but maybe, maybe we have a, a, famous uh or celebrity listener that would be mm -hmm. i would love to know that yeah yeah maybe we could have them on us again oh yeah that would be Is great saul our celebrity listener I, as of right now yeah he's <laughs> he, the most famous person we, we know. did get a request someone requests that we interview saul on an episode do we want to go that route i don't know if you'll be able to get a uh camera working on zoom or oh they're like definitely that, that would <laughs> i i don't think he even knows a camera i think that would have to yeah. be like He's probably calling from a landline. Yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so, definitely. Uh, definitely a a, a a rotary landline. Yeah. <laughs> so. But if you do have, a, if you are a musician, you want to submit music, or um, or you know someone who wouldn't mind submitting their music, uh, we do have a Pinelands Nursery prize pack, which uh, is typically like seeds and a hat and and a mug a and mug maybe and, a scarf. Yeah, Although, we have a box of stuff sitting in the corner over there that we just kind of grab some stuff out of we, and send it we all may be out of winter hats but if we are i know we have uh some like sports athletic shirts yeah, yeah. you know like long sleeve athletic yeah. shirts so we could probably probably accommodate we just throw whatever we can we can find yeah you'll get, some you'll get some from goodies us from us if if yeah. you help us out and give us a song let's so, we've talked we, about the song <laughs> no one i'm curious if anyone is interested i'm curious if there's any interest in native plants healthy planet merchandise yeah. Do you think we're big enough yeah. to start thinking about that? Uh, I don't. I don't know what, when, what big enough is. I well, don't know if there's interest. We've thought about making stickers, stickers, at one point. mugs, yeah, shirts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. I don't know. Uh, like we have. This is the mug that we send out. If you're watching the YouTube video, the the uh, mug that we send out for Pinelands Nursery when that's part of the mm -hmm. prize pack. So we should now that we can show stuff on the video i can have some of the yeah, stuff or yeah. you can and we can yeah. we can throw it up here but so, you know we could have something like this with a native plants healthy planet logo yeah on it, it. so maybe we even put up a poll in our our facebook group or if, you, if you're not in the facebook group join the facebook group or um you can let us know there if you want uh if you'd be interested in t-shirts mugs that kind of stuff there you go i'm yeah. i'm draping myself in a, yeah. in a, <laughs> in a nursery, nursery scarf. scarf let's see of course the with the logo there you go it's all right it's not that not that cold in the office, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as always you can listen to native plants healthy planet uh directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com but unless you're russ fernari you're not listening that way you are no. listening on podbean or probably not even there you're listening on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher um I think I saw Siri XM is having podcasts now too. I don't know if we're going to be on there. It's very limited. But, I looked, yeah, I looked, it's, it's a very curated, they they're doing their own and then it's, it's really the top, top. We're not quite there. That yet. might be our next goal. Our we got to make it to get on Siri XM. XM, but you know, it's interesting. I don't we can know be if extraterrestrial. Our listens on Apple are actually not so much going down. Our listens on other devices are yep. going up uh, oh, yeah. Spotify and Stitcher and uh, overcast all mm -hmm. even Chrome. Yeah, just Chrome. Yeah. People are listening on the web. Okay, that number's going up. I'm sorry if I offended anyone <laughs> by, by, <laughs> by that comment. I know Russ can take it, but um, when you're there, uh, please subscribe. Please re, re, uh, leave a five star review. Uh, those really go a long way oh, into totally. helping us and and getting more exposure to this native plant mission that we're on. Yeah, so, definitely. Um, and last thing is, when you're home or when you go to a friend's house, ask Alexa to play the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast. I do, be, I do it fun. in my house. Yeah. Just I think it's interesting that I can say that. In yeah, my voice it makes on. you feel powerful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Even if they have a fire TV, you can say it mm -hmm. into the remote. Yeah. and uh have just a pop go and, up. yeah find all of their electronics and somehow subscribe all your friends <laughs> and and just sabotage them with native plants healthy planet <laughs> podcast stuff so with that this has been a really fun one uh, I, I really enjoyed it i did too so i did too with that i'm fran or i'm uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is he's fran i'm tom uh, i'm tom he's pam i'm jim so. <laughs> thanks everyone i'm tom <laughs> And I am Fran. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in for uh, this episode of The Buzz. 
We'll see you again next time. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.